All righty, let's talk about the SVS Ultra Evolution Pinnacle. These speakers retail for about $5,000 a pair. It's $2,500 each. And they were loaned to me directly by SVS. I was not paid or anything of that nature. I wasn't given anything free to do this review. Let's get some specs out of the way while I show you some video of the speakers in my living room. On the front of the speaker, what you see are a plethora of drive units. You have a one inch dome tweeter, two five and a quarter inch mid ranges above the tweeter, and then above the mid ranges, you have two eight inch mid bass drivers. On the back of the speaker, you also have the same two eight inch drivers as well as two ports. You can see that this speaker is a very different design with a curved front baffle. The idea there is that it's going to provide you better time alignment, which is supposed to provide you better cohesion. Let's talk time alignment really fast. Time alignment, as I said earlier, is basically when all the drivers are hitting the microphone or your ear at the exact same time, and you can measure it. You can do this by measuring the impulse response. What I'm providing here is an example of the SVS versus the Polk R500. The reason I chose the Polk R500 is because it's a two-way design. So it has multiple woofers and then a tweeter. So we see with the Polk in blue, tweeter, woofer. And that's how it goes. Like tweeter comes in and then about, I don't know, that's 1.9 to 2.2. So let's, well, 2.1. So let's say about 0.2 milliseconds after the tweeter arrives, then the mid woofers arrive. But you'll notice with the SVS, there's just one peak and then the dip, and then it smooths right out. So based on this, I would say that the SVS is actually time aligned or somewhat closer to ideally time aligned. Keep in mind that at the crossover point, everything matters. It's not just physically time aligned or electronically time aligned. It also matters what that crossover is doing. Is the crossover in phase or out of phase? It doesn't matter if everything's time aligned if the signals are completely out of phase. In fact, in the theoretical world, you can have a tweeter and a mid-range completely time aligned, but if they're flipped in polarity, then the sound that's hit to your ears, is gonna cancel. It's gonna be completely out of phase. And you're gonna have a major suck out at that crossover point. So it's not just about being time aligned. It's also about having the right crossover slope and point. These speakers are pretty large and they weigh approximately 100 pounds each. The height is just under 50 inches. The width is about 12 inches and the depth is about 18 inches. You can see that I was sent in the gloss black version, but there's also white and a vinyl ash version. And the gloss looks really good. The overall build quality of these things, in my opinion, is very high. And I would say that for $5,000 for the pair, just on aesthetic alone, it definitely seems like it has a good value. As far as sound goes though, let's talk about that. But before we do that, let me give you some ideas of the terminology I'm gonna be using. When I talk about the speaker off the wall, this is what I'm talking about. If I say it's three feet off the wall, I'm talking about three feet from the back of the speaker to the wall. If I talk about toe in or toe out or on axis versus off axis, everything is referenced to zero degrees. Zero degrees is on axis, and that's what you see in black here. So if you're listening right here in the middle of this couch, these speakers in black are pointed directly at you. They are on axis zero degrees. If I say they are towed out by 30 degrees off axis, that would be this red. Now, conversely, I could tow them in further and have them crossing in front of you, but it's very rare that I recommend any speaker be done that way. So I've not given that as an example here. Let's talk about the pros first, okay? Now, a lot of this is gonna be just my subjective impression on what I heard, what I see. And then I'm also gonna throw in some elements of the measurements. And we'll save the deep dive for the measurements a little bit later. First up, as I said, excellent build quality. I just really like the way these things look. In terms of sound, the soundstage radiation is very nice and wide. I would say it's about plus or minus 70 to plus or minus 80 degrees. So it's a big wide hemisphere of sound radiating out into your room. But that may come at a cost to you if you have a very lively room where it's very full of echo and things of that nature. You may find that you need to add acoustic treatment or you may prefer a speaker with a more narrow radiation profile. These speakers can also get pretty dang loud with very low distortion, as you would expect for a speaker that has as many bass drivers as it does. And I will say that I believe, objectively speaking, that this has the lowest harmonic distortion measurements of any speaker I've measured thus far. Now let's talk about a couple cons here. First off, this speaker is not a linear speaker. And to be honest with you, I was a little bit disappointed about that. What I was hoping was that SVS was going to take the trend that they have from their previous speakers, which tended to be a little bit bright on the high frequency and above 
let's say about above four kilohertz or so, tweeter region. What I found in this case, and even in listening at Expona, was that that was resolved. I didn't feel like the speakers were bright. However, there is a bit of a dip in the upper mid-range and then followed quickly by a peak. And that dip peak makes that peak, at least to my ears, stand out more as kind of shouty or sharp. And that was the one issue that I had in terms of overall tonality. The other thing is that these speakers will need to be brought out from the walls. There's a pretty wide Q bump in the lower bass region around 70 to 80 hertz. You're gonna see that in the data shortly, but you can definitely hear it when you set these up in the room if you put them close to the wall. So what I recommend, bring them out from the wall at least three feet, or if you have equalization, which most of you probably will, especially if you're using these for our home theater, then use equalization to tame that. You'll be doing other equalization as well. You may not even notice it, but if you don't have equalization, you need to bring these things out from the wall. I also suggest that you aim these speakers directly on axis, which I'm kind of surprised. So when I was first listening, I thought, well, that there's a peak somewhere and it's kind of shouty. Let me tow them off axis. Let me point them out away from the room or from the listener. And in doing so, it didn't really resolve that, which told me that there was going to be a continuity error in the radiation pattern horizontally because that should have resolved when I turned them off axis. And the fact that it didn't made me know that something's going on in that lower treble region. And sure enough, it pops up in the data. Now, for an example of what I'm talking about, here you go. This is how I would recommend positioning these speakers if you don't have equalization. The load on these speakers is gonna be pretty taxing, especially if you're thinking about trying to power these with maybe a more budget-oriented AVR or maybe a budget-oriented amplifier, something like the IEMA or the Fosse or the WIM amp. I've tried all of those with these speakers. And I will say that I could not drive these speakers to the output levels that I wanted. These things might be one of the harder speakers that I've had in to drive. Now, it's not a problem if you have a good separate external amplifier. Maybe you're liking Crown amplifiers, or maybe you like Emotiva, something along that kind of line. Get a good stereo amplifier or a couple mono blocks. I did try this with my March Audio P501, mono blocks left and right separately, and no problems. But when I switched it over to the WIM amp, I was definitely missing some output there. Same thing for the IEMA, I think it's the A70 Max that I just reviewed not too long ago. When you're using these, the tweeter is about, I think it's about 32, 32 and a half inches off the ground. So make sure that whatever setup you have in your living room, that will allow you to get your ears close to the tweeter axis or within about plus or minus 10 degrees. Because if you go above 10 degrees of that tweeter, you're really gonna start noticing that you're missing out on certain details in the upper mid-range area. When I'm doing my listening, I'm listening to all sorts of stuff and you could pretty much name it, I listen to it. And in my listening, when I initially set these up against the back wall and I had them facing me, the bass was just too boomy. Hence me saying, bring them off the wall or use equalization. When I pointed them away from me, I still heard that upper mid-range shoutiness, but I also felt like I was losing a little bit more in the top end and so when I look at the data, I'm seeing some things there that make perfect sense. And speaking of data, let's take a look at that. All of the data that you're about to see is captured using my Clipple near field scanner. And you can see now, this is my new setup. Funny story, but not quite funny. I put the speaker up there by myself. It's about hundred pounds. hundred pounds, lifting it and setting it on top of a four and a half foot tall platform, not a huge deal. If it's just a dumbbell or something like that, not a big deal. A four foot tall speaker that wants to lean and do all this stuff, that's a different ball game. So what I did months ago was I purchased a lift, a load gate lift. It's a little hand winch on the back, you crank it up. Well, that sucker broke on me, but luckily it didn't break with this speaker more than like an inch off the ground. Everything was fine, but that left me in a bind. So I got a ladder and I kind of did like one of these and through pure sweat equity and high pucker factor of the rear end, I managed to finally get that thing up there. I measured it as you see it in this picture, and here we go. First up is the impedance data. Now, as you can see, this impedance is actually not too bad, above about 200 hertz. But down here, it wants to take a pretty hard dip and down, down to 80 hertz, it definitely gets down to 2.6 ohm. Now, if you're using a crossover and crossing this over to a subwoofer, this stuff doesn't really matter. But with this size of speaker, I'm assuming that you're probably trying to take advantage of the extra low frequency output and low distortion. So you're gonna probably wind up crossing it, I would say 
maybe 40, 50 hertz, right? Which is feasible with this speaker. But just keep in mind that the load is gonna be more than you're probably used to. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have a good power amplifier for this. Uh, sensitivity is about 88.1. You can see the linearity is, is actually not terrible. It's, it's within about plus or minus, I'd say two decibels or so for the most part, but we do have some outliers. Like there's this bit of a peak right here around 700 Hertz. There's this narrow dip around 1.6 kilohertz or something like that. Are you gonna hear this narrow dip? Probably not so much. It's narrow enough where it's not gonna be a distraction. The thing that you probably are going to notice is this peak, dip, peak right here. The main thing that I noticed was when I put this in the room, this was just too much. So I definitely had to bring it out from the wall. But when I went in and added equalization around 70 Hertz, I dropped it 3 dB with a Q of one. It's It sweetened that right up. It made it much more, uh, more linear. Some additional equalization that I did was I brought this up around 300 Hertz. I boosted that with a Q of about, I think it was around 1.5 and I boosted it by about one decibel. And at least to my ear, that sounded better. It sounded more full in that lower male region. Uh, and the other thing that I would recommend doing, and you'll see this in a minute, is around two to 4K, you might want to EQ that down a decibel. And I'll show you why shortly. F3 at 40 Hertz, F10 at 27 Hertz. CEA 2034 data set, basically the same thing you saw before, but let's look at the ERDI. So the early reflections directivity index, narrowing up through the high frequency, and then something's going on around here. Now remember this speaker has multiple drivers vertically. If you were just looking at the horizontal early reflections directivity index, which I'm showing you right here, then you can see it's not so bad in that one to two to three kilohertz area. You do have some diffraction elements going on around maybe like 4K or so, but otherwise the horizontal is not really that bad. But this looks kind of crazy. And I really wanted to point that out because you have to keep in mind that the vertical also plays into the ERDI. So sometimes the ERDI may look worse than it's gonna sound. And just make sure that you separate that information out. You can do that with the contour plots. I'll show you that in a second. Estimated in-room response. And the blue line is roughly how I heard the speaker in my room once I brought it out from the wall. This mild Q bass boost, I've already talked about that enough. Uh, somewhat of a scoot mid-range between about 800 hertz to two kilohertz, give or take. And it may sound a bit hollow. I didn't really have an issue with that so much. My issue was more this right here. So because this dips down and then followed by a peak at around two to three K or so, it makes the mid-range sound somewhat shouty, somewhat forward, just a little bit too brash, if you will. If this peak were here, but without this dip, it might not have stood out as much, but you got this combo factor and it swings at about plus, I'd say plus or minus two decibels or so, that's gonna stand out. Horizontal radiation is about plus or minus 80 degrees. Nice, nice and wide. However, I do wanna point out, see where this dips down and then you start getting wider around here? Well, this is where that tweeter's coming in. And the tweeter is wider in radiation than those five inch mid ranges are. Because of that, you're gonna get extra sidewall bounce or reflection from that tweeter region from about two to, let's say maybe, well, well, all the way up even. My recommendation would be, and you can do this if you want or just don't. My recommendation is that this is a speaker that's a good candidate for sidewall absorption. And I would put that sidewall absorption between about 50 to 70 degrees of that first reflection. So if the speaker's pointed at you, figure out where 50 to 70 degrees is, and that first bounce off the sidewall, and then put some absorption right there. And I think that when you do that, because I tried this out in my room, when you do that, you should notice that that extra, that shoutiness should kind of dissipate some. So you can fix this speaker, fix this speaker without equalization and with sidewall absorption. The vertical is about plus or minus 10 degrees, reference to the center line, which is the tweeter. And you may be wondering, what is all this? This is lobing. If you've watched my video about why you should not use common MTM type designed center channels where you have a mid, a tweeter, and then another mid, then you know that the issue there is lobing. The sound waves, they basically don't mesh together. They don't provide a cohesive sound front. And because of that, what happens is you get some off axis cancellations at certain angles. And if you follow this up through here, you can see that it varies per frequency from about 2K to about 5K or so. It changes from 10 degrees to 50 degrees. This is why I suggest making sure that you're within about 10 degrees of that tweeter axis if you can't be directly on axis because the tweeter is relatively low. 
Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels, very low. Harmonic distortion at 96 decibels, still below 1% all the way down to 40 hertz. Like that's really good. Multitone distortion is a bit higher in this upper mid-range area. And my guess is that this is probably due to the tweeter, right? It, it's possible that it's the mid-range, but I believe the tweeter might be crossed somewhere around two kilohertz and it might be 1.8. I would have to go back and check, but I don't want to do it right now because I'm in the middle of talking. But I think it's around 1.8, so I think that is going to be the tweeter. What happens if you use a crossover? Does it change that at all? No, it doesn't, which gives me further evidence that it's the tweeter and not necessarily the mid-range. But it is worth noting that the mid-range distortion does lower. What about dynamic range and compression? Okay, wow, everything looks really good, but this area right here shows some issues. This makes me also believe that what we're seeing is compression from the tweeter. And that does it for this review. If you appreciate it, make sure you smash that like button. That helps me out, helps me grow the channel, and I would appreciate that. If you'd like to support what I'm doing here, you can join me at patreon.com and get early access to these kind of reviews and behind the scenes footage. It's really cool to have that kind of support, and I really appreciate it, and I try to do something to make it worth your while if I can. Alternatively, if you don't want to send any cash my way, but you do want to support, you can do that by just clicking any of my affiliate links. If you have to go to Best Buy or Target or Amazon or Crutchfield or Audio Advice, just click the affiliate link in my description. Go buy whatever it is that you need to buy. That'll earn me a small commission at no additional cost to you. And it really does help. You know, every little bit helps add up and will help pay for me to get a new load lift since the one I have is broken. Anyway, hope you appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below and I will try to get to them as soon as I can. I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.